Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next The Reckoning of Roku chapter analysis video. This one's going to be for chapter 22, which is called Roku Alone. Um, straight away, uh, I have YouTube channel membership enabled on the channel. If you would like to help support the channel, you can click the join button if you would like to help. Otherwise, subscribing is also a really good way to help. But we'll jump in here. Obviously, big chapter here. Roku alone, it's got the name alone title convention, so you know it's going to be a character-focused chapter, because yes, this is the chapter where we learn about the backstory of what happened with Roku and what happened to Yasu. Um, uh, while we also get some present-day stuff, because of course Roku has just separated from uh, Gyatso, he's annoyed after the big argument that they had, and he's, you know, trying to continue on his path as the Avatar without Gyatso. So this is where the flashbacks come in and we get to a pretty interesting point at the end here where we get a sense for like, okay, this is Roku's kind of uh, arc on his own here as, uh, as the Avatar. So we jump in here and we have Roku walking across the island uh, by himself. He's trying to prove himself as the Avatar and sort of prove to Gyatso and Sister Disha that as well as himself, that it's not a mistake. He is the Avatar and he's going to do this mission here. He's going to find the Earthbenders and protect them from the dangerous natives, uh, but also get them away uh, and do what he what he needs to do as the Avatar here on the island, of course. Um, so he's, he's heading up and we get the idea here that suddenly sunset hits and he's beginning to notice this on the island that when the sun, sunset hits, the fog goes away. So for a, for a small period of time, he can see quite far across the island, unlike basically any other time. So he gets a, a sense of the lay of the land for the first time properly here um, and he continues on his way, but it's just starting to rain. And obviously this is meant to be kind of symbolic because of course we know the backstory with Yasu relates to the water, the ocean, and now here's the rain coming in in the present day. That's what they're going for here, of course. Um, but also Roku's trek across the island is going to be more challenging because the rain across the slippery rocks as he's on the, the cliff face type thing. That's uh, what we're doing here. But we do a chap we, we do a, a scene cut to the flashback. So this is like four years ago. It's 12 year old Roku and of course 12 year old Yasu. Um, we see here straight away the, the interesting detail that they refer to each other as kind of nicknames. So they shorten each of their names. Yasu calls Roku Ro and uh, Roku calls Yasu Ya. Um, so that's a, a fun little detail here. But they're out here, uh, they're going swimming in the sea. Sozin was meant to be with them, but he got in trouble for incinerating some centuries old tapestries at the academy while he was attempting to teach himself to firebend blue flames. So continuing on the trend of Sozin, even a few years ago, was still always interested in learning special firebending techniques and it got him into trouble in this one incident, which is the reason Sozin isn't with them going swimming here, of course. That's the, the big deal. So it's just the two brothers here out at sea. So it starts to rain and Roku suggests that, hey, why don't we head back? But of course, Yasu suggests they go on ahead. So you can immediately see the contrast between the brothers. Yasu is the very confident one, whereas we know Roku is very much lacking in confident. He's the one who fades into the background, where Yasu always stands out. That's what they're going for here. Uh, and they kind of continue as they kind of go through this. Um, Roku even notes that he's really happy to be out here with his brother because even though they spent like the entirety of the first 10 years of their life kind of around each other at all times, in more recent years since they've gone to the academy, um, they've kind of spent less and less time together because at the academy, they're around all the other kind of boys at the academy rather than being around their family. And also Sozin and Yasu have been the kind of closer friendship dynamic among their kind of trio. And Roku feels that he's being left behind. They're the ones playing pie show together, sparring, doing all this stuff. Um, but Roku isn't so much. So 
with the idea that Yasu asks Roku to go on this kind of, uh, you know, swimming trip together, basically, he jumps at the opportunity to not be left behind again. So that's what we're kind of uh, doing here. Uh, and, and we just, again, build up to the idea of, yeah, you know, the, the, the difference in approach of the two brothers, one being very cautious and worried about what if the Academy finds out we're doing this? Won't we get in trouble? But Yasu's like, no, no, it's going to be a great time. Even if we do get caught, it'll be worth it, is the kind of idea here. But then we cut back to the present and we just get a quick little scene here highlighting Roku continuing his journey across the island on his own. The rocks, of course, are beginning to get more and more slippery uh, and it's going to be pretty bad. But he then comes across some fragments of earth bending, and he notes that when you kind of piece them together, it, it, it reveals a cavity in the shape of clasped hands, and also another group of fragments that suggest it was around someone's leg. So he realizes he's beginning to catch up to the earth benders. He's quite close now. Uh, so Owen's group is up ahead. We, of course, know that this is specifically what Malaya was trapped in by Chija um, from like the previous chapter. So um, that's an interesting detail. And so Roku, seeing a sign that he's on the right trail, picks up his pace as he continues along the path. Well, we cut back to the flashback here. And this is the scene where it kind of all goes down. And it's so kind of casual and normal. And then... Boom, like it does just happen. I think you already get the sense for what actually happens to Yasu straight away. I think it's been pretty clear for a while that this is what happens, but this is the uh, the way that they approach actually doing it. So they note that, of course, it's beginning to rain and the waves are beginning to get a little bit stronger, but it's not like so bad they need to like immediately get out. And um, Roku again is like, okay, we're we're pretty far out from shore. I think we should go back. But Yasu wants to go ahead to the next sandbar. And they make a joke about Roku's lack of sense of direction. Yasu says, um, the sandbar is that way. Um, didn't you get lost in the Academy's library last week? Um, and Roku's like, oh, they, they rearranged it. <laughs> um, but they go on. And Yasu heads out. Roku stays where he is. He's not going to the next sandbar. So this is where they do split up a little bit, uh, highlighting their different approaches, of course. Uh, he calls out, be careful. Okay, mother, is what Yasu responds with. But this is exactly the point where a wave breaks. And so they don't even describe it as it being like a huge, huge, huge wave or anything like that. It's just one kind of, in a way, sneaks up on them. It's enough to knock Roku back into the water. Um, and we're, we're, of course, in Roku's perspective. So Roku gets back up out of the water and kind of shakes the water off his face and looks over to where Yasu was, but Yasu isn't there anymore. And we get a large description here of Roku's reaction to this and the build up to this is the loss of Yasu. But fundamentally, in the moment, this is when it happens. Yasu is gone there's no saving him at this point. This is what actually happens to him. Yasu gets sort of swept away by a wave while they went when they while they were swimming together. That's what happened to him. It's a very normal thing in the sense that like there's no avatar unique specific dynamic that has happened here where like a spirit was involved or bending was involved. No, it's just they went out swimming and a and a random wave kind of got him that's that's it so so normal but it's it's very kind of oddly fitting for Roku's arc as like this character who of all the avatars we know is probably one of the most normal of them uh, acknowledging the idea like he's a no, he's a noble but he, and he's friends with Prince Sozin otherwise though he is just a a normal Fire Nation kid basically and so at 12 years old he has to deal with this moment happening here of like he can't find his brother and I think the writing is very strong here for a 12-year-old panicking, not being able to find their brother anymore, and just that slow realization of he's not just, like, messing around. He, he's he gone. What do I do? Oh, no, I have to try and save him. I can't save him. 
now I have to save myself. Th th that thought process, I think, is really well done across this because, yeah, he thinks that like, oh, he's dived down below the surface before to scare me. Maybe he's just doing that. No, nothing. He waits. Yasu doesn't come back up. And you get the idea. A lump formed, formed in Roku's throat, his eyes stinging from the salt, welled with tears. He started to hyperventilate as panic threatened to overtake him like a swarm of buzzard wasps. And he's thinking to himself, what do I do? Do I go back immediately? Do I try and get help now? Or do I have to, if there's any saving him, it has to be me here in this moment. And so he realizes like, okay, I actually have to look for him. So he dives below the surface multiple times, calling out for Yasu. But again, there was nothing. It is made clear here, Yasu is the stronger swimmer um, than Roku is. Um, but Yo Roku is trying his best here, but there isn't any sign of him and it's a bit of a helpless situation in the middle of the water he has no clue where he is what direction he could be in that whole sort of thing there is just a real sense of desperation throughout all of this um and he's realizing that oh i'm growing tired i if i try to dive again i'm probably not coming back up i have nothing left all i can do is go back i have enough to make it back to shore and that's it and he has to do that he calls out one last time and heads back to shore and what we get here is just this idea of as he gets back to the the shore next to the bonfire he shoots a fire blast up into the air to call for help uh, and kind of collapses onto the beach waiting for help to arrive and there's a bit of a kind of daze sense here as just people arrived more people arrived so many others arrived to help out they did everything they possibly could to find him other people swam out they got boats out they used uh, bamboo poles uh, fishing nets to try and search for him but nothing and so roku gets the confirmation he's sitting on his academy bed later on sozin comes in he has his head in his hands and he confirms it that they could not find Yasu. He'd vanished, stolen by the sea. At the funeral, there would be no body to burn. And that th those last few sentences just really hit you of like, it is this kind of relatively to the point simple thing, but there's a, a, a brutal kind of simplicity to what's happened here. And you see the idea of this of like now we're going to have this kind of awkward funeral of like a 12 year old boy has just been killed here it's roku's twin brother his parents have lost their one of their sons uh, and you're going to get all these very interesting dynamics when we get to that funeral because uh, they do have the quick moment of like yeah his mother and father arriving at the beach um and they're incredibly emotional about this as well um but then we get back to the, we cut back to the present day. And again, we again highlight steep mountainside in the rain, Roku slipping all over the place, but he's still trying to prove to himself, I can do it. I can do it on my own. I don't need Gyatso or anyone else. As he makes his way up, he slips on the rock and falls off the cliffside, basically down into the darkness. And so the idea is he... You, you, you sort of in a way show a failing in Roku's past here he is failing to make progress across the island and it's this low low moment for Roku here but of course we know he survives this so where has he ended up on the island we will get it before the end of the chapter so then we cut to the funeral and I, again I, I think the funeral is really well done that in a way what actually happened is one thing but the thing that really has the, I think, the lingering impact on Roku is more so, like, is his family's reaction, his parents' reaction, really, to this at the funeral here. This is what really does a number on Roku for years and years, that he's barely just about getting over, that sort of thing. And yeah, Roku carried the white marble urn, because you see he's sort of the focus of this. Like, it, it's a member of his family who, who the funeral is for. It's his twin brother, so like he's placed in a spotlight in a way at the funeral. Uh, he's flanked by his parents, grandparents. There's the, the royal family is here, the fire sages, the rest of the nobility. It's a notable funeral in the capital that's happening here. And they note, there's no body, so Yasu's remains were not inside the urn. 
Instead, the urn held the ashes of 12 years of treasured possessions. This is the confirmation that they're 12 while all this happens. So we go through this. Uh, what's included in here is the cloth he was wrapped in after his birth, the first pair of woven koala sheep wool slippers, a wooden dragon carved by their grandfather, a wooden sword with which he'd slay the toy dragon, his favorite brush, his favorite poem, his paintings, his Komodo rhino leather bracers, and a headpiece that had been a gift from Roku on their last birthday. If these were the objects Yasu would have uh, himself chosen to represent his, sh his short life, nobody would ever know. And there's all these little moments like that that just hit you of like, yeah, like, are these the actual things that really represent Yasu? It's the best that anyone can do, given what has happened here. Um, and yeah, again, it's just described here, Roku is just in this daze. His his head is still on the beach that day after Yasu's been washed away. That's all he can think about while he's going through the ritual of the, the funeral here. Um, he lost half his spirit when he lost Yasu. He'd never be whole again. So they arrive at the ceremony at this point. They go to the section for Roku's own clan. And Roku, of course, has to put Yasu's urn into their section and that's his kind of part of the ceremony done and so he kind of comes back to himself and notices like his mother remaining there sobbing at the base of the wall and his his father beside her and um, helping her through this but then this is the, this is one of the big moments at one point Roku's father looked up eyes rimmed with red and aged a day a decade in days he took a deep breath and quietly said, you should have saved him. Then he helped Roku's mother to her feet and led her away. Roku waited to cry until they turned the corner. And it's a kind of a bit of a shocking moment that like for grieving parents, it's like, do you understand that? I don't think to to their other son at the funeral for his twin it's it's such a no 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 don't say that because the the big thing you get here is almost like this disconnection in the family straight away of like the father and the mother kind of helping each other through this but Roku's kind of just on his own like they're not helping him and that's part of the the problem and I think it's ultimately there it is in, in one little section why Roku doesn't really have a good relationship with his parents is that it is because they weren't really there for him in the aftermath of, of all of this happening. Um, and he suspects in, in his head, he's thinking to himself of like, what, where does that come from? It's that, yes, he's always suspected it. Happy Yasu, their firstborn, if only by minutes, had been their favorite child. Um, his father's comments and his mother's silence had confirmed as much. He couldn't. He could not help but feel they would be happier if it were instead his bloated body floating somewhere out in the open water, feeding the sea. And this is prompting the idea in his head of like, it should have been me. And he says as much when Sozin comes over. It should have been me. And he and you suspect that Sozin, who's friends with Roku, should be saying, no, don't think that way. But instead it's pause, silence, still nothing. And he's just getting the sense of like, oh, I, I guess Sozin agrees too that it, it probably should have been me. Because after all, Yasu was closer to Sozin, especially in recent years. Um, but what Sozin says after the big pause is, it's useless to linger in the past. And Roku notes, it wasn't a disagreement. So he finally speaks and it's like, okay, don't think about the past, but it's not disagreeing with what Roku actually said. It should have been me. Um, but Sozin continues, we can only look to the future, be who Yasu would have wanted us to be. And Roku says, I don't know who I am without a brother. And uh, Sozin pulls Roku in close and says, I'm not Yasu, but we're brothers too, Roku. Never forget that. We will always be brothers, always, until the very end. So... He kind of saves it at the end here. Like this is Sozin in a way deciding at this point, I've lost my good friend, 
one of my brothers effectively, Yasu, you have lost your twin brother also. The two of us are the two of our trio that are left. We are the closest now, basically, going forward. This means everything to both of us, this connection. And this is this makes complete sense in a way. They've, they're both dealing with this major loss here. And they're going to help each other kind of through it in this way. But Sozin didn't disagree with Roku when he probably should have. But he kind of gets there in the end, ultimately, you, you'd say. So it's an interesting uh, dialogue sequence to kind of um, to kind of go through, ultimately. Um, but also, the idea of Sozin saying something like that, we are brothers until the very end, given that we know the very end of this friendship, that ultimately Sozin betrays Roku, but they were brothers right up until the end. Sozin came to Roku's aid on his island um, after everything that happened. He came there to try and help him and it was just, he took advantage of something else that happened to Roku. The, the gas hitting him and finally a chance for, you know, something else to take out the all-powerful avatar. Um, so, you know, tragic, but you know, it's, it's it's not wrong what's what Sozin says here. Like they do have a super strong connection right up until the end. And um, but that's just interesting to consider. And the chapter ends with a present day scene. So Roku wakes up in darkness. He is in a cave. He's kind of fallen kind of like through the island effectively into the cave system that we've kind of been in before. He was sore, but not injured in any way. But he considers to himself, I probably should have died from that fall. I must have somehow managed to save myself by doing some kind of instinctual bending, basically. But one other interesting point that happens here he is he he activates his fire bending to create a light, and he notes that uh, surprised at how little energy it seemed to require, despite how depleted he felt. And then he throws the light down the the cave to see how how, how big it is. And he expects it to peter out after like just a short distance, but it just keeps going. So it's like, whoa, that was a really powerful like fire kind of like light that I just sent down the, the, the cave. Didn't know I was that powerful type thing. He then sends a fire punch down the other direction to get a sense that way. And a similar thing happens. It goes really far. It's pretty big. Um, and he just realizes like, I have no idea where I am. I'm in the middle of a, a maze of cave systems and I don't know where to find the earthbenders. Have I just, like, failed here? But then he laughs to himself, and it's just like, oddly, at this moment, he remembers Yasu's last words, basically, in a way of, like, didn't you get lost in the Academy's library last week? Um, and here is Roku lost, in a way, once again, having just remembered what happened to his brother. Um, so that is where we end Roku in the cave system, like, we're basically in or around where Ulo is, where the sacred cave is. So they're going in a little bit of a different direction with uh, Roku here. So we're kind of wondering, oh, where's Gyatso then heading to on his own? Wonder what's going to happen here. But the big thing here is definitely uh, getting the flashback sequence and just the actual incident, the action of how Yasu died. But then I would say almost more impactful is... The, the somber nature of the, the funeral afterwards, of just their, it being for a child, there not being a body, and then the the blame, like, without directly them, anyone super blaming Roku, the blame being assigned to him to a certain degree, and just the, the interesting ways of, like, how the parents kind of react and how they, they don't really help their remaining son through this, and Sozin... Maybe not giving Roku everything he needs, but being one of the few people who was actually there for him in it. Um, it's it's very intriguing, and I, I like it. Um, I'm, I'm assuming some people will probably have the reaction of, like, uh, it's a little maybe plain in a way, like, that there wasn't anything crazier that happened. But I like that Roku's big kind of tragic backstory moment is sort of a very normal thing of just went out swimming with his brother and one of them got swept away that's it he he you can't really blame him for what happened but it is one of those situations where he feels like 
What if I had done something differently? What if I had been more confident and was able to prevent Yasu from, you know, charging ahead uh, without me? That sort of thing. Like if if he just wasn't in that position and hit by the wave in that spot, maybe I could have actually saved him. Um, but the parents then like saying that to him, it's it's re- that that's a good punch of a moment where you expect like oh his parents come over to him at the funeral. And that's all they have to say to him. And, and and immediately at that moment, you understand, like, I, I kind of get why there really isn't a relationship between them anymore after this. And likely where, in terms of his family, Roku maybe turns to his grandparents to kind of get a stronger connection, given that this, the death of Yasu has clearly, to a certain degree, destroyed the parents uh, in all of this. Um, and then... The, the present day stuff is obviously a little bit more simple to the point. It's just kind of Roku continuing the hike on his own. But I, I like the intensity of like he's trying to prove to everyone that he's not the sort of in a way failure of he was from this backstory, not being able to uh, protect his brother or, or save his brother. In this case, he will save those earthbenders. He will do his role as the avatar, but he slips. Another, you know, in a way, a mistake. Did you blame? Do you blame him for slipping? No. In the same way, do you blame him for what happened to Yasu? No. But he blames himself. And now, where is he? Is this going to help or not help? That's the idea that we have here. So I, I really like this chapter. Um, it's, uh, I, I think it's really well done for like the literally the centerpiece of the book because it's right at the halfway point of the book. Uh, where we are here so in the comments let me know what your thoughts are on roku alone what happened to yasu uh, what's happening here with roku but uh let me know in the comments below but that's been the video thanks for watching and bye